This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. It's Thursday, the 13th of October. We welcome you to this edition of Real Talk, Jesperson and Hicks. Hello. How you doing this morning, pal? I'm doing okay. You? Ah, doing doing excellent. This is show number three from our new studio, and uh, every, every single day we're encountering uh, new joys of being in here, uh, sitting around this table uh, put together beautiful. by Urban Timber, which is pretty spectacular. Mm-hmm. It'll be our first Real Talk roundtable presented by Urban Timber tomorrow, and I'm looking forward that one but we're also running into some some challenges as with anybody in a new workplace in a new situation and and uh off the top of the show today i just wanted to let everybody know that we're here today (laughs) and this show is running because you are problem solving like a boss you feeling like you're starting to settle in it's it's a new place yeah i i love it though look at look at how beautiful this 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 table i know incredible if if you're listening on the podcast you got to check it out on on uh youtube at, at least at some point and then we'll be doing a better job uh and by we i mean me we'll do a better job on our on our Instagram and our TikTok and our Twitter and everything else showing off these digs and uh, and taking you into the you know the tour of the new Real Talk studio so to speak in just about um, well less than five minutes we're going to talk to Sarah Elder Chaminara Sarah's uh, not been on the show before but a lot of people politically engaged folks in particular in Western Canada but I think across the country are familiar with Sarah uh, if not her her brand, Madam Premier, she's uh, it's a political and feminist fashion brand that she founded. And yesterday in uh, somewhat of a, is it is it a, a turn of events? I think it's fair to call it that she put her company, she put her brand up for sale. And it's it, it appears to be prompted by uh, a conviction that she has about a polarization in, in politics and generally speaking in 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 the general population's inability she feels to find nuance. Uh, she says there, there's there's camps, and we'll let her. She can put it in her own words for us when we talk. I was intrigued by her tweet yesterday when she put her her company up for sale publicly. It's it, it it sort of knocked my you know knocked me back. It blew me back on my heels a little bit because it's 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 I don't uh, think that this is how she envisioned this going. But she basically she says I want to wash my hands of this. I want to get out of this. There's there, she says you know you're either with us you know for us you know with us or against us type idea now in politics yeah. nobody nobody it seems to be uh, meeting in the middle to, to, to share conversations to share or debate ideas to have healthy differences of opinion and as I'm reading this from her her Twitter thread yesterday we'll get into this with her I'm thinking I'm thinking like this is this what she's describing this is what real talks all about you know this is the whole point uh, I saw somebody this morning, this kind of resonated. I saw this about, you know, three minutes ago, right before we started doing the show, you know, someone on Twitter, a lot of people have checked out our interview with, uh, now premier Daniel Smith, Alberta's newest premier. A lot of people have checked it out. We appreciate those of you that have downloaded and, and, uh, and obviously there's a lot to talk about. Uh, Danielle Smith's made news, to put it lightly, uh, to put it mildly over the past couple of days, including her comments on the most discriminated groups uh, in her history on planet Earth. Uh, you know, she believes she's asserted that that the unvaccinated are the most discriminated against group she's ever seen in her history. Yesterday, uh, from the premier's office, kind of the, the non-apology apology. Like She didn't say she was sorry, but she issued a statement. And said, "Yeah, there have been other, uh, there have been other groups, there have been other groups that have been marginalized and discriminated against." She says, "I'm going to make an effort to talk to them now that I'm Alberta Supreme. I'm going to schedule meetings." You know, I saw, I saw, you know, for example, a Jewish advocacy group had reached out to her and said, "You know, in, in my words, not theirs." Uh, you may have heard of, like, for example, the Holocaust. That may have been one example of people being discriminated against. I've seen LGBTQ two S plus groups reaching out, you know, publicly on Twitter and saying, you know, Premier, uh, perhaps you've heard about the battle. Uh, perhaps you've heard about the war that has been waged for for marriage equality and for other uh, obviously important priorities. Maybe that might be discrimination that might wind up on your radar. So a lot of people are talking about this. I mean, you know, you, you, you take a look at where the conversation's at across the country, in particular about politics in Alberta, and that's where people are focused. Mm-hmm. So we're talking to Danielle Smith before she made that comment. Of course, sometimes that's just the way that it works out. Yeah. And I've seen people online, you know, one person says, well, Jesperson sold his soul. I sold my soul uh, to talk to Danielle Smith, the premier, on the first day here in the new studio. And it resonates with me. I mean, we laugh that stuff off. 100%. You know, uh, at the same time, the point that Sarah's making, 
saying there, there appears to be no nuance anymore. Maybe there's this inability or maybe people have just forsaken or walked away from the priority mm-hmm. that used to be, as they say, seeking to understand. Uh, and, and, and real talk is built on that premise that this is where people ideologically, uh, you know, may it be politically or otherwise, from different perspectives and different points of view can meet to have a conversation. So I'm looking forward to this with Sarah picking her brain. Is she going to retract putting her company up for sale on Twitter? I don't know. Uh, I'm looking forward to that conversation in just a little bit. And then Kelly Rudick joining us a little bit later in the show. This is going to be an interesting conversation. Kelly's an economist. He's a strategist. He's worked with different levels of government. As a matter of fact, he won a national award uh, for what's called priority-based budgeting. And, And he wants to take us into, I'm going to be honest, here's the real talk. When you talk about budgets and politics, people's eyes start to glaze over Mm -hmm. like budget day is a big day with governments and with journalists and then the general public kind of wants to know like what's the budget looking like everybody wants to know the one number what's the deficit uh or or what's the projected surplus that's pretty much all people care about how is it going to land in your lap what difference is it going to make in your life well kelly says that a lot of communities uh and maybe across the country will get his assessment on this we're doing it all wrong like the focus is wrong out of the gates A lot of municipalities are going to be putting budgets together right now. So we thought we'd dig into it at a level we're going to avoid, you know, as they say in uh, Terry and Diener and everybody in FUBAR, we're going to turn down the suck (laughs) on the conversation around budgeting. Uh, And and I know that it's interesting because it matters to people. Like it matters to our bottom lines. It matters to our communities. It matters with regards to where our priorities are as a society. And so I'm looking forward to that conversation. Plus, I want to get some emails we got a couple of great ones after Cheryl's yesterday. Mm-hmm. Cheryl taking issue with, with the, the whole sort of anti-vax or vaccine hesitant theme of what Premier Smith brought to the table here on Real Talk. And, and what Cheryl had to say resonated with a whole bunch of you, including, by the way, a fellow by the name of Mark. I was out grabbing dinner last night on Edmonton's beautiful 104th Street. Great shop. A new place called Northern Chicken on 104th Street. It's their second location in Edmonton. Congratulations to the whole team there. Mm -hmm. And this guy, Mark, he's sitting at the bar. He's just got his elbows up in the bar. And and, and as I walk in, he just said, he goes, I'm not going to bug you. I said, you're not bugging me. He goes, I just wanted to let you know. He goes, I tune in on YouTube. He goes, I live stream the show every morning. I said, Mark, you're getting yourself a shout out out of the gates. He goes, you don't have to do that. I said, I don't have to do anything, but I want to do it. And so a shout out to Mark and everybody else that joins us every day on the regular. It means a lot to us. If you do join us day after day, you know by now that you have just a short period of time to get your hands on your Covenant Foundation lottery tickets. And before we get to our feature interview this morning, I wanted to remind you that you're not going to want to push this into the final deadline of November 3rd, all right? We've still got a couple of weeks here, but why wait until the very end? Don't procrastinate. Your shot at living in life-changing luxury starts with picking up your tickets today at covenantfoundationlottery.ca, a $2.2 million dream home. Yeah, that's, that's the star. That's the grand prize but they're also giving away beamers and alfa romeos and and they're giving away a beautiful lexus how about hella skiing adventures a guided fly fishing experience of course luxury vacations to pei in new york and scotland and portugal and a whole bunch of other amazing spots all in support of the misericordia and gray nuns hospitals 30 years of life-changing wins with the covenant foundation lottery We also want to say we're going to be talking about budgeting and saving money. One step that you can take for your own family right now is to take a look at what you're paying for your utilities. Electricity prices have been through the roof. And so it makes sense to audit your own family's expenditures. Parkpower.ca, they're in the game with internet, electricity, and natural gas. And their website makes it super easy for you to compare rates. What you're paying right now versus what you'd pay with them. The fixed rate, the variable rate, there's a whole bunch of different options. Plus the promo code 2022-REALTALK is going to knock $70 off your first bill with Park Power. Now, speaking of electricity rates out of control, makes more sense now than ever, doesn't it, to get into the solar game? Kubi Renewable Energy is leading the charge in Canada. You see what I did there, John? They're leading the (laughs) charge in Canada with solar energy solutions to power your life. A full-service contractor, residential and commercial solar power systems. Ask them today about the federal government's Canada Greener Homes Grant, $40,000 up for grabs, an interest-free loan for you to get solar panels on your roof, 10 years to pay it off. Kubi can do all the paperwork for you. You'll find them online at kubienergy.ca. All right, well, here we are. 
yesterday, scrolling through Twitter, and all of a sudden, a prominent brand owner, a prominent uh, political and social persona in Western Canada has put her business, her successful fashion brand, up for sale. She says she wants out. Uh, Sarah Elder Chaminara is the founder and owner of Madam Premier. Uh, it's a political and feminist fashion brand that advocates for the increased participation and the election of women and marginalized people in politics. Uh, Sarah's had a, a multi-partisan podcast called e- Elected. You've probably seen it that features conversations with women and allies in and around Canadian politics. She's also a former political staffer, having worked for the BC Liberals for five years before moving to Alberta about 10 years ago. She's making her Real Talk debut this morning. Sarah, welcome to the show, and thanks for making time for us. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Were you, in a way, as surprised as I was that you're putting Madam Premier up for sale? I said, wait a second. A lot of people uh, over the past few years have really rallied around this brand. I didn't expect to see you preparing to walk away from it. Well, I mean, that wasn't something that, I mean, well, you know, this has been a long conversation in my own head um, for a while about, you know, what I want long term for myself and for my family. Um, but, uh, the last week or so have just kind of solidified things in the direction. I, I just see a clear future for myself, um, given what's happening politically in the province. And I just don't see it necessarily getting any better. And it's a hard space to exist, to have any kind of conversations. And I'm sure you can, you've, you've experienced this as well, to have any kind of nuanced or thoughtful conversations where you're not on my team or you're on someone else's team, and then that's all it is. It struck me as as uh, as though you were implying that because you had not picked a side or you had not picked a team, or even more so that your brand had not picked a team, a political team to support, that, that people on so-called both sides have been making your life miserable. Is that accurate? Um, I mean, in different ways. So for example, um, you know, I've made masking or had made masking in the store uh, mandatory, even outside of when it was mandated um, by the city of Calgary or um, by the province. So I, you know, I took that on because it was important to me. I implemented my own vaccine passport in the store um, because retail was ascent- was supposed first supposed to be included and then the UCP walked that decision back and um, exempted us by making all retail um, an essential service in Alberta and I thought that as a mom uh, coming to you actually live from my car <laughs> yeah, I just love having it. done school drop off. <laughs> Um, that, you know, and my, my children being three and five were only recently, very recently eligible to be vaccinated. That was something that I wanted to do to make sure that I was protecting them and, you know, anyone that we came into contact with. Um, so, you know, I've been told I'm a Nazi, for example, to my face, I've had people call the store and ask for me for by name and tell me, you know, uh, what a horrible person using very, very strong language. I've had, um, you know, all kinds of different things on that front. At the same time, so you would, I don't know what side of that, that comes from kind of all sides of the political spectrum for the most part. But it also comes from the left. The left is, a, it's a particular challenge because the purity test that some impose on anyone who tries to do anything is just a little bit over the top because a them, they themselves would never pass that. And so having conversations, for example, around electing all women or taking a multi-partisan approach to absolutely anything is to some people just not on because um, you should only be electing women that you agree with that only have the same political ide- ideology as you. And so For me, I come at it from a multi-partisan perspective. For me, it's about seeing more women in politics, no matter the party. You don't have, that's the thing, you don't have to actually vote for any of these people. Um, That's up to you when you're in that ballot booth, but you're telling me that there shouldn't be more women on the ballot. That's what I really struggle with. So you were, you were interviewed, right? Can you, can you provide us some background details here? (laughs) Um, Someone had noted a journalist. I I saw Jason Markusoff noted with the CBC, but I know a lot of people have been talking about it, that that Alberta becomes the first province or territory in Canada to have uh, uh, 
well, I can't say elected right now, but to have three female premiers, right? Obviously, Rachel Notley, Alison Redford, now Danielle Smith. And you commented on this, right? And, and it yeah. seemed to have, uh, it, it sort of like brought out the trolls, to, to put it colloquially. Well, and so I was asked to comment for um, an article in the Globe and Mail on, you know, Alberta being the first province in Canada, first province in Canada to have elected three women. Well, and again, elected with a big asterisk, right? Because like, what does that mean? And it's all very kind of messy. And she's not elected by Albertans. She was elected by members of the UCP. But because of the way things are, she is now Alberta's third female premier and she will go we will all go to the polls next year and decide and then albertans will have will make their decision about where whether she stays on or not but bottom line right now she's the third woman um in alberta to serve as a premier this is a canadian first and so i was asked to comment i was asked a very specific question about this milestone and so my quote was I don't want to still be celebrating the third woman as a premier in Alberta or anywhere else in Canada or in the world because electing women should be the norm and not an anomaly. So that's what I was asked to answer on. And that's what I said. So um, I shared it as a graphic on, on Madam Premier on Instagram. Um, and, And then early afternoon, I got a phone call from someone who didn't identify themselves and said, um, you know, like we saw your post on Instagram and that could be considered um, you supporting her. So do you support Danielle Smith? And I said, I wasn't asked about my support of Danielle Smith. I was asked to comment on Alberta being the first province to have three women as premier. Uh And like, so first of all, I mean, anyone calling and asking for you by name because they feel like they know you, which they don't actually. Um, But then asking very, you know, direct kind of questions and in kind of a way that makes it seem like there's more to it. Like like, there's going to be consequences. Yeah. Like, why are you calling me and what are you going to do after this? Like, are you recording the call? Are you trying to like, is this a like, what what are you doing? Um, It's just... And after that, and then, so I made some Instagram videos um, about the phone call and because I I try to communicate really, you know, in an upfront um, way with like the Madam Premier audience and with things like this, I'm, you know, I do want, I really do try to have conversations that are thoughtful and nuanced. Um, But in this moment where we are, not just, I think in Alberta, but kind of globally, this you're with me or against me attitude is to me, I really think this is going to be like, what you know what breaks us well and and here's what i and one of the main re- i mean first of all i've been wanting to get you on the show for a while and i don't know what the hell took us so long but it's great mm-hmm. to have you here but one of the reasons why i found your uh post i mean to to, to publicly by the way do you stand by putting your business up for sale? Is Madam Premier still up for sale as, as we speak? Okay. So, so so to I woke me- up this morning feeling like slightly lighter. Okay. So it's a step in the right direction for your mental health or for your sense of well-being. For Yeah, because I take all of this stuff with me. I'm not someone who um, I think there are a lot of people that perceive that I'm like this, you know, like structure made out of brick. That's actually the complete opposite. I feel things very deeply. Um, and so anytime things like this happen, um, like it impacts my mental health. It impacts that, you know, my time with my family. It, it like I can't so much of this is so personal and so it's hard to separate that for me um and so the idea that I will be able to hopefully do that is like a relief you well people are you know I mean just uh, even in our live chat here just wait till the podcast drops but Charlotte says you know Sarah's right about it she calls it this purity test with regards to feminism Trisha says you're spot on Sarah the judgment the hatred it seems from all sides is endless I mean to me it's significant that you're looking to walk away from this or at least take take a step back from the public facing side of what you've been doing because your brand and your advocacy has driven so much conversation has empowered so many people I mean when people think of the Madam Premier brand and they can check you out online uh, obviously at madampremier.com you know I, I think of like mayors I'm thinking of 
of elected officials. I'm pretty sure you've had members of parliament, ministers, people wearing your shirts, people rocking your apparel. You have been one, I mean, your podcast as well, that has driven political dialogue. You're not just a participant, you are a prompter. And so to have someone like, I mean, I would look at it like someone like me saying like, I'm going to fold up the tent. I'm not interested in having the conversations anymore. I'm not interested in taking the abuse. I'm not interested in the hints, allegations, and things left unsaid. I don't want the phone calls. I don't want to be called, you know, this morning, someone on Twitter suggesting I've never had a soul or I've sold my soul. I don't want to see that stuff anymore. So I'm shutting it all down. It is a big deal. I mean, you're a former political staffer. You've been in the mix for a long time. This isn't just the average person saying, I need a break. I need to walk away. It's sending a message to people, I I think. And and you probably knew it was going to. Well, you know, no, actually, I didn't. Really? I didn't think that this, you know, I didn't think I'd be having a conversation with you in my mm. car this morning yeah. um, when I sent that out. I honestly, you know, just thought that, you know, people would be like, oh, OK. Um, but I mean, like, how do you deal with your mental health? Like, how do you deal with all of these things that, you know, when people say things about you that are just like blatantly untrue or just like so over the top like how do you take care of your own mental health like these are the conversations like for so anyone who's like you know doing their own thing who has their own business who doesn't who doesn't have the supports of being in you know in a large corporation like we're really on our own and in a political space in the political climate that we're in right now um it's really hard and i don't have any buffer between um myself and my social media so it's 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 all me and i mean i've even at one point um someone shared a screenshot of someone who was commenting who had made me a part of a conspiracy theory um around um developer groups in calgary during the the municipal election last year and naming me and how i was involved in that and like it was creepy Mm. um and like thankfully people called this person out on that behavior but like um where are we going what are we doing um things were on today's day three of danielle smith as premier of alberta we've had a very eventful couple of days so far (laughs) um like what is today going to bring but going back to the women aspect of this so you know people will say I think on all sides of the, well, they'll say on all sides of the political spectrum that we want to elect more women, but then drill down a little bit and who that is changes depending on who you talk to. Mm. And surprisingly, I would say actually on the conservative side of things, on the more right side of the political spectrum, they're like, they want, they don't care at all. (laughs) They want like anyone when we move to the side of the political spectrum that you would label as progressive, that's where it gets a lot more interesting. And they're not interested actually in having all women. So, and I understand for me, things like, you know, discussions of like, um, like it's just not on if you're, for example, like transphobic or you deny the existence of, you know, um, of human rights to, to any group, including women, minorities and marginalized people. Um, so, but again, that's like, that's a personal decision that you make when you're electing someone, but where these conversations, I think get really tricky and it's, hard. <laughs> you know, thank you for giving me the space to even, you know, have this like venting session. Of right course. Now. But like, let's say, um, a trans woman wants to run for the PPC. Right. Let's say a non-binary person wants to run for the conservatives. Do we, what, like, because the, the party that they've chosen to affiliate themselves, because that's where their political ideology aligns, we don't celebrate that? These are tough questions you're going to ask people. This is a gut check, right? So, I mean, I, I remember, know. I mean, I grew up in a family where the priority, what it always was. I mean, I feel like my my paternal grandfather set the tone. He and my grandma, they, you know, on Sunday afternoons, the, the the dinner table, they they would invite guests. There'd be family members and guests. Oftentimes, as a kid, you'd be meeting a new adult you'd never met before around that table. And I remember a vigorous exchange of ideas. Uh, I remember that uh, almost every Sunday. And it was something that I grew up valuing because my family valued that, and that shaped my perspective to this day. 
But I have a, yeah, I mean, like, gosh, Sarah, we hear it all the time when, when we'll bring guests on the show and, and people's you know, perspectives may not align. And, and, and I always think that's funny, too, because there are people, there are members of this audience that span the political spectrum, obviously. There are people that listen from Western Canada predominantly, people listen from Eastern Canada, people young and old, people rich and poor. I mean, the, the whole idea is to have this sort of a gathering place. But when you welcome somebody onto a show like this, and I don't know about your podcast, I'd love to talk to you about Elected as well, um, but you, you, know, you welcome somebody on this whole idea of platforming. You know, someone the other day is, not someone, many people the other day accusing us of platforming Danielle Smith. She's the premier of Alberta. Like, real talk is not platforming the premier of Alberta, though I appreciate the shout out or the implication that we can manifest power wherever we like. But we see that all the time. If a talk show is going to make you uncomfortable as an audience member, if a talk show is going to exchange ideas with someone uh, with, with, who, with whose ideology you do not align, then it's platforming as opposed to having a conversation. I remember back in the day when talk radio, the, its entire mandate was to have conversations. And I'm really concerned, and this is kind of what drives my conviction in how this show operates, I'm concerned that people are losing the ability or at least losing the value that they may have at one time placed on challenging their ideas, on putting them through the ringer, on seeking to understand other people's perspectives. You know, And to me right now, because we know that anger sells in politics, the rage farming that we talk about it all the time on this show, it's effective. And political leaders are winning elections, tapping into that anger. But it's having this really unfortunate trickle-down effect where people just aren't talking face-to-face -face like maybe once they did. Now everybody's just arguing on the Internet. And the unfortunate, one of the unfortunate side effects of that is it's driving people like you out of the game. You're not interested in being as engaged anymore. And you're someone that's motivated and inspired a lot of people. So, so that's what raises my red flags. Yeah, and I mean... I, I, I don't want to all of the negative to drown out all of the positive because like they're very recently, for example, just like a week ago, um, someone wrote to me sharing that um, their daughter, who um, actually has a future prime minister T-shirt, had um, started a petition about a, around a very, very, very worthwhile idea that they had and, you know, that there was that you know, how meaningful that was for them. And, you know, they wanted to share that with me. And, you know, those things are very special. Um, it's just, it's a really hard space to be in. Like, it's just really hard. Are you going to keep really... doing, are you going to keep doing your podcast? I don't know, actually. So I have two guests um, left um, that are scheduled, and then I'm not sure. Hmm. Because, again, that is a place where um, having conversations with women and allies across the political spectrum, and it's like, well, why am I not only hearing from people that agree with me? Hmm. And it's like, so, and it's about platforming, but it's also like, okay, so if you give this person a, a, a platform, but then, okay, like I've even had people, for example, um, um, you know, there was a photograph of Rana Ambrose on the website wearing the woman's places in sweater. So it says, and this was my initial design. This is like what started it all. And it says a woman's place is in uh, council chambers, the legislature, the House of Commons and the Senate. So there was a picture of Rana, Rana Ambrose in this sweater. And someone took the time to message me and say, um, you know, and it always starts this way. I really like what you're doing. But uh, Rana Ambrose is on the board of Jewel the e-cigarette company and i don't know if she still is or not right and therefore i cannot support you right okay like i'm not on the board of jewel yeah you know like so the leaps that people make and then essentially but i mean you know like conversations around platforming cancel culture um like all of these different things are really hard to have because the pushback is just so extreme mm -hmm. and in alberta it honestly, it makes me think of like in politics in BC is like um, literally like unicorns and rainbows, puppies and lollipops um, compared to politics in Alberta. Mm. Uh, right now, Lorraine says, you know, there's so much hatred and anger 
around us? How do we change it? How do we work toward coming together and making life better for all? If you could wave your magic wand, uh, if you could change the tone of political discourse, what, what, what's one move in the right direction, according to you? What's one thing you'd like to see? I guess what I'm asking you to do is give each of us an assignment right now. Give us something to think about. As people are now, we're wrapping up this interview. I can picture this person right now. They're walking their dog. They've got their AirPods in. Give us an assignment for this week. I mean, so for every time you look at a story or for every time you, you know, no matter what you listen to, like, consider thinking about like the opposite what like so like the other side of things and people will be like you can't like other side things and it's like well there are different perspectives that feed into things and so consider where you're getting your media if it's always from the same places consider um you know like facebook or instagram or your neighbor jerry who tells you about something that they read online and doesn't know where and can't verify what he said is that like an accurate source of where you're getting your information and to political leaders, I think they are the most accountable in these situations um, because they ultimately benefit. They're the largest benefactors of this ecosystem and, and the climate they've created because they're doing all of this to win. And this is across the political spectrum. Um, and so I really wish they would just take a step back because I think that honestly, in this situation, it's the people, no matter where we are, that lose out on thoughtful conversations on this, this hyper polarization in political culture. Um, like, congratulations, you've won an election, but I think that society loses. Hmm. Kim's watching. She says, I've enjoyed spending my money at Madam Premier. Uh, I wish Sarah only the best. She's done some heavy lifting and she deserves to remove herself as a target. Uh, that from Kim on our live chat. My assignment to people is going to uh, go to MadamPremier.com and buy out all of your stuff. Hey, eh? let's see. Let's see a big revenue surge before you walk away. Let's let's uh, let's boost the books a little bit for 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 an interested well, buyer. I appreciate that because that's <laughs> also like an aspect of this is also that Madam Premier like is a business and. I do have like rent. I have like, you know, bills to pay and uh, opening and running a business during COVID has had its own set of unique circumstances and challenges. Um, but honestly, I know that there are people and honestly, I was actually someone said that I'm and I'm not a Star Wars person, but someone said that I'm like a Sith. OK, I don't know. I think that's not a compliment. I don't know. It's not. I don't think it's a compliment. John is a Sith. Yeah, no, not a compliment. So, you know, like there are lots of people who are, you know, relishing in this because they see it as like my downfall. Um, and to you, I, you know, in particular, I would say that that's really sad. Um, and. Uh, but Sarah, you, you know, know, like like that, that whole idea, and, 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 uh, you know, it's kind of funny if you, if you use a phrase like cancel culture and people, you know, people are out outraged that you would use this. It's, it's not cancel culture. It's consequence culture or whatever. But I would say that, you know, we've experienced it on this show and I've experienced it in my personal and professional life on a number of different occasions. And sometimes I've been right and sometimes I've been wrong and sometimes I've stepped in it like anybody would, you know, seven and a half hours a week in front of a live microphone. I, I defy anyone to do it for years and not every once in a while say something or fuck up or do something you'd like to take back. But it goes beyond the point where it's simply, I disagree with you. I disagree with your idea. I'm going to turn the show off for now. I'm going to unsubscribe. I'm going to whatever. It's like the idea that I am going to burn your house to the ground. And that's where people are these days. People, if they disagree with you, Sarah, or they don't like, and I know we haven't even got to this story. You told me this off camera, but like you had, you stocked a book in your store that somebody didn't like. And so they went after you. I mean, we have people and God bless our sponsors. I'm about to name a whole bunch of them that I'm really proud to do business with. They field phone calls from people that are demanding that they pull their support from the show because there's been a guest on the show that that person didn't like, like get over yourself. But people are in the mindset now that if they don't like the color of your house, they're going to burn it to the ground and I don't know if that's new or not, but it's more prevalent. It feels like it is than it used to be. 
Well, and you know what? Like, I do actually think that some things deserve to be burned to the ground. Like, sure. for example, the patriarchy. <laughs> uh, I think you have a shirt along those lines, don't you? <laughs> no, I don't. But like, <laughs> there are seriously things that do deserve to be burned down. Um, like the systems and institutions that uphold, um, you know, uh, systemic bias, the systems and institutions um, that, you know, uh, that maintain, um, you know, uh, systemic um, discrimination, discrimination against um, indigenous peoples. There are so many legitimate, also add to that, uh, and this is a, a more of a hot topic, but um, you know, even the police uh, or Hockey Canada, like, let's think about actual systems and institutions that need significant structural change. I'm completely happy to see those burn down and to rebuild them. Um, or, you know, people who are just honestly, you know, the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world in the U in U.S. politics or, um, you know, or Donald Trump even, um, like, there are some really big things going on in the world right now um and we have some really important decisions to make as individuals about who we want representing us the vision for our provinces and our countries going forward um and so like there there are very worthwhile causes um and things that you know that do deserve to be dismantled um but in terms of thinking about people and uh you know, who, 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 who actually don't fall into that category of like, you know, doing actual, um, like it, they're, it's just different. It's different. Are you further away from or closer to seeking office than you would have been a few years ago? No, no. I've um, said for a long time that I'll never run. Never. That's a no. definitive statement. Well, listen, no, because I can't like, I can't, I can't handle the polarization and i don't think that there's actually um i don't think that there's space for me on the left and there would be space for me on the right um but like broadly speaking um but i'm too i'm i don't fit into anybody's mold hmm. and unfortunately if we're talking provincial politics um i don't think the alberta party is viable yeah i know barry morishita would uh I know would, would would beg to differ. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to see, by the way, on a side note, what happens in that Brooks Medicine Hat by election. I know, you know, this is an Alberta political conversation. Oh, here. Daniel we Smith's going to we know what's going to happen. But I'm just saying it's interesting. Barry Morshita, former mayor of Brooks, former president of the AUMA. It's his home territory, his home turf. He's going to run against her. She, I, I think like no offense to Barry and he's going to come on the show and he'll have his platform. I'll say this to his face and he'll respond. But like, I think that she's going to trounce everybody. I think she's going to win with like 75, 80 percent, to be honest. And they'll get out the vote and they'll make sure she gets her seat in the legislature. But like, what if like it could get interesting? What if? Anyway, I digress. I do think, you, like know, you, you know, I'll just say this. You know who you should be watching? Huh? Carrie Kundal. Yeah. Running. Calgary yeah. Elbow, right? Calgary Elbow. Yeah. Yeah. Carrie's going to run a really impressive campaign. Um, and obviously there is no by-election in Calgary Elbow um, because the UCP know that they would lose. Um, otherwise they would run it right away, like in a heartbeat. Um, but Carrie Kundal, watch out for her. Um, she's going to run a really strong campaign. Yeah. Uh, Carrie, a, a lawyer out of Calgary, and, and she sought the leadership, I remember, of the, of the Alberta Liberal Party, wasn't it, back in the day, I think? And and yeah. uh, she's been politically engaged for a long time and, and draws uh, a ton of respect in political circles. So I, I do agree with you. That's, I mean, of course, that was Greg Clark's riding. I mean, it's, the Alberta Party has held that riding. Rolf Klein's former riding. Uh, so that's an interesting one in Calgary Elbow. Listen, I'm just I'm a fan of what you do. I've been a fan of your brand. I know a lot of people are. You've you've you have motivated people and I've seen it. I mean, that's that's why we reached out to you. I've, I've seen it on Instagram, Twitter over the years. People rocking their new Madam Premier sweatshirts, rocking their new Madam Premier T-shirts. I mean, you have elected officials the morning after winning big elections rocking your T-shirts. It's been a big deal. And I think it's a big deal that you're choosing to walk away from it too um but i suspect as a matter of fact i know uh that you driving this conversation here today is going to get a lot of people thinking and that is a big move in a positive direction and i'm grateful for it sarah well and i hope so and you know instead of commenting you know or saying you know like whatever it is taking this in a negative way on social media i just like 
maybe just take a step back because like I honestly I don't need it and I don't think that you I'm speaking you to whoever might be saying these things like honestly you don't need to do it either it's going to hurt you too um and you know the designing of everything that I do myself like I, there's just, there's just so many aspects of this um but you know I'm I'll, I'll also say this um like I I'm excited for a life after Madam Premier this is something that I will say I can say I've always done um but you know and I I'm especially tied to community building and uh and doing different things so um you know I'm looking forward to doing something that um allows me to continue to do that it'll just look different thanks for doing this from your car uh i know <laughs> we we kept you way longer than i thought but i just i feel like you and i just kind of had coffee you know we just sat and had coffee for 30 minutes so i'm grateful for your time sarah and we wish you all the best keep us posted on what you're going to do and i know that we'll look forward to a lot of people look forward to catching those next two episodes of the podcast as well people can link to everything we're talking about via your website madampremier.com we've been talking to sarah elder chaminara have a great rest of your week my friend Thanks, Brian. Yeah, you got it. I love that. Doing the interview from her car after dropping the kids off at school before she goes and runs her business. That's the story of so many people. That is, you talk about attracting the right people to politics. Are you talking about people who, who, who you want to have driving policy? We're going to talk to Kelly Rudick in just a second on, on budgeting and policy and government decision making. People like Sarah, to me, those are the good guys. Those are the good ones. These are the ones that, that prompt us to think, that force us to think. Uh, and, I, and I think hammer out our ideas and better understand why we arrive to the conclusions that we're at. I know that this is going to get a bunch of you thinking, and we want to invite you to be in touch with the show to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We value your opinions and, and, and your assessment of what you've heard on the show. Got a great email from Jeff yesterday, John. Uh, I read Cheryl's email about the pandemic and the mm -hmm. measures, and if you missed it, uh, you can always go to our show notes, like the episode descriptions, and we put the time codes there so you can jump to wherever you want to go in the show. Um, Cheryl's email yesterday, it's not a long one, but it gets right to the point. It's worth your time. Check it out. Uh, that was our uh, October 12th edition, so it prompted Jeff to reach out he says, nice new studio, by the way. He says, Look, looks like you and John are getting settled in. You're welcome. <laughs> he says, when you read Cheryl's email about the temper tantrum, that is people blaming others for their plight during the pandemic, Jeff says, I was literally shouting. I was pointing at my computer. It's all caps here. Yes, 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 he says. Uh, he says, I just so passionately agreed with her email, and it's exactly what I've been thinking over the past couple of years, that from Jeff. We love messages like that. We'll get to Kelly in just a second. This conversation, of course, made possible by sponsors like our friends at Apex Automation. Apex Automation, their team has like tripled, like literally tripled uh, in the past few years. They're attracting the best, the most talented professional engineers in the country and beyond. I mean, the international market has been bringing out some of the best and most talented automation experts in the world. I, ju I just met two of their talented team members that just came in from China. They've moved to Alberta, uh, and what they're doing, they're automating processes across industries. So, you know, what you're seeing right now, for example, if you're checking this out on YouTube, this is this is a shot on my phone. This is a behind-the-scenes peek. Uh, this is Apex testing, John. This is an automated system that, that runs... Uh, this is an oil and gas facility. As, as a matter of fact, it's a SAG-D facility. But they're doing stuff in brewing. They're mm -hmm. doing stuff in mining. Anything that can be automated, Apex Automation is doing it. And if you're an engineer feeling unfulfilled with your current company, they would love to talk to you. They're all about the people. They're all about their team. You can learn more about Apex today at apexautomation.ca. A big shout out as well to the team at Westworld Computers. You know, one of their team members was listening to the show yesterday. They heard about the catastrophic, <laughs> you know, me, me smashing my laptop two minutes before we went on the air. Yeah. And one of their team member reaches out to us and he said, we will keep an eye out for your booking. We're going to go to westworld.ca <laughs> and book in. And, and I love this from their team member. This was Blake. So a big shout out to Blake at Westworld. He says, uh, he says, I wanted to offer your, our assistance to be proactive in getting your laptop repaired. They're all <laughs> about customer service there, and they're your Apple experts. You can shop online right now. They've got MacBook Pros and MacBook Airs on special because they're overstocked. It's good news for people like me, I guess, that are in the market. And, of course, their, say, their service team as well is big on maintaining those relationships. Westworld is your Apple expert at westworld.ca. I'm loving driving this Ram 1500 Longhorn. 
Bjorn that I've been in. The crew cab, the four doors, absolutely fantastic. It's got the Hemi power. Better on gas than you might think. If you're in the market for something that can do some heavy hauling or maybe looking to upgrade a 4 by 4 just in time for that snow falling, you're going to want to look at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. Uh, not just Alberta's best selection of the Ram lineup, but also, of course, Jeep, including North America's best-selling SUV ever, the Grand Cherokee. They value your trades. You can check out their pre-owned inventory, even schedule a service appointment online today. Just visit the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. And a shout-out to our friends at Friesen Brothers as well. For 65 years, Alberta-grown, Alberta-owned, in 16 different communities. Circle your calendar for the first of the month at every Friesen Brothers store. Every grocery purchase over $75 is going to be 15% off. That's a big deal. Blazing savings at Friesen Brothers on the first day of every month. I think of Friesen Brothers, and I just think of those sourdough cinnamon buns. Every time I think of Friesen Brothers, and I've got a bit of a hunger, <laughs> I can't stop thinking about the cinnamon buns. Oh, I like the rhubarb pie. Oh, attaboy. I love it. You know, I always love hearing when you, when you uh, and your beautiful wife, you guys check out Friesen Brothers, oh, because you go in there and you found, I, I know that the, the, the ad is done, and we're done, and we can move on here, <laughs> yeah. but just one of the things I thought this really cool is the different perspective you've been bringing to the table as a plant-based family. Yeah. And, and there's lots of things. They're 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 not labeled as plant based, but that's one of the things. The rhubarb pie. I was looking. I'm like, okay, there's no butter, there's no dairy. I can eat this. Yeah. So first time I went, I grabbed a half one, and then I was like, that that didn't do us. Because you don't want to go to the, the store the like you know. But even, I like the option. They have the half pie or the full pie. You right. can buy. It's great. Who buys the half pie? <laughs> well, Who buys the half single pie? Single folks, I'm sure. You know? I guess. <laughs> I think that there's actually a there's a segue here to be done. Ah. Uh, we're about to talk about budgeting. We're about to talk about expenditures uh, i think that the pie metaphor might work here but but but, <laughs> but but i won't try too hard all right kelly rudick's uh, been a good friend of this show for a long time he's he's an award winning planner as a director of corporate planning he actually received a canadian association of municipal administrators award that's a national award for implementing what's called priority based budgeting now before your eyes glaze over and i know that kelly's gonna laugh because we know exactly what we're talking about here we start talking about budgets people go oh really we're gonna talk about budgets but it matters it matters because budgets indicate our priorities in how we're building and maintaining and growing our communities right uh, Kelly's a U of A grad with a major in economics and a local government certificate, certainly an engaged citizen, making his Real Talk debut this morning. It's nice to see your face. Welcome to the show, Kelly. Yeah, good to see you. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, great. Looking forward to the chat. Yeah, we're about to get into the budget season. It's about to you know, become really relevant. Uh, municipal budgets, you know, Danielle Smith will put forward her, her provincial budget, the first one by way of her finance minister. Of course, the federal budget's always a big deal, and there's been some details uh, released on that this morning, as a matter of fact. We can get into that. When you talk about budgeting, Kelly, I mean, this is your jam. What does a budget <laughs> communicate to a population? Well, a budget, like you said, uh, demonstrates what's important uh, to citizens, hopefully. Um, hopefully you've done whatever order of government uh, has done a good job of listening to what the aspirations of the community is and uh, put their best foot forward in aligning their resources accordingly. So you, how did you, like when you get into this and you get to a point where you're receiving national awards for, for the, the counsel you've provided and the advice you've provided as a, as a consultant, what sets in your mind, what sets a good perspective or a good approach apart? Like what really catches your eye uh, with regards to what the general population might keep an eye out for? How do you know if you're being well represented or if a budget's a good one, so to speak? Right. So, well, I would say the story that's communicated with the budget. So if you hear things like, oh, we saved some money by cutting here or there, I think uh, likely what's happened is what's happened historically, unfortunately, is the numbers are driving decisions. Um, if I'm looking for a good budget, uh, I'm seeing that maybe there's been some reallocations done from one area to another to um, identify or align to those things that are important to to the citizens. Um, and that's kind of what priority-based budgeting does. It looks really uh, long and hard at what you do, uh, the value that it brings to, to those priorities, 
and turning the dial up and down depending on where that value lies. So can we t tell, tell me about this priority-based budgeting? Because I know you've been trying to get this on the radar of provincial parties and, and, and certainly of governments. But, but what's, I mean, it seems like the, the name explains it, priority-based budgeting. But people will say, well, obviously, every budget is based on priorities. So what sets this specific approach apart? Right. So priority-based budgeting starts and ends with priorities. Um, too often, I think you hear these words like efficiency and effectiveness when, when we look at budgeting. And what that leads to is really substantiating everything you've done last year and just looking at a costing exercise. What, what priority-based budgeting asks you to do is you know, take a little bit of a pause and truly understand the programs and services that you're providing. And then you actually go through an exercise of scoring their value, like literally having numbers involved where um, you have a sliding scale of, of what these, these programs and services are providing and as far as a return for what the citizens want. And done well, it, it, like I said, it leads to those reallocation opportunities where you, know, you stop spending in an area that isn't as relevant or driving the value that you want. So um, you know, it, it gives you that ironically enough, these tax savings, things that you've seen before, like cuts and, you know, across the board, let's all find 3%. Done well, priority-based budgeting does that and more because you don't spend on things that have become irrelevant. So the, so the question, I guess, ultimately becomes how is the government aware of or how does the government uh, find conviction in, in what it deems to be the priorities? I mean, this is something that's got to be communicated by citizens, right? I mean, the onus is on citizens here, isn't it? Yeah, genuinely um, do an engagement exercise where you're asking different questions than maybe we would have asked before. Um, I know what a citizen is going to answer if I ask them whether they want to pay the same taxes as they did last year. Um, but they're probably um, answering that question from an area of ignorance. They don't really know what the bundle of services are that they're getting uh, from the government. So it's part education. It's part asking different questions. And then, you know, genuinely looking inwardly um, and not substantiating what we did before, but, you know, getting really creative about um, reallocations and looking for where that value alive. You know, one of the one of the missions that we have on this show is that, that people, you know, engaged citizens, politically engaged citizens, when they have a politician, uh, someone seeking office or seeking to, to, to maintain their office, to seek reelection, when somebody knocks on your door. Uh, if you watch or listen to Real Talk, you're going to have a couple good focused questions for the door knockers. And, and in this circumstance, I think especially with incumbents, uh, it would be valuable uh, to be able to have, you know, what you might call like a, a relevance check or an accountability, so to speak. What's one question you would love the average citizen to ask a politician in this context who's knocking on their door? I would frame my conversations around well-being. I think that government is is and should be in the in the uh, mode of providing uh, long-term well-being for citizens. So, I would ask them, you know, what they feel the most important thing is to drive, you know, happiness or or joy in someone's life. Uh, too often, most of these conversations just start and end with "I want low taxes," and it's just. It's too easy. You open the door for a politician to then say, well, OK, I promise you low taxes. Yeah. And, and the conversation kind of ends there. I love that idea. How 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 have policies supported by you uh, driven happiness or joy in the community? It's an unconventional question, but obviously a really important one. I'm big on case studies. Uh, I, I love hearing stories. I like to, to, to be able to to focus in on a success story. In this circumstance, is there a, a government or is there a political party? Is there an example where you can say they get it? They're doing it well. Well, um, selfishly for me, I would toot the horn right now of, uh, of the town of Westlock. So the town of Westlock's been engaged with me for close to two years now. And uh, we've taken the, the strategy of, of doing this um, incrementally um, because there's some change culture that needs to happen in, in our space right now. Uh, this would be a new way of doing things, but um, town of Westlock has 
uh, really rolled up their sleeves and they've created what I call a strategic planning framework around decision making. And, and you know, they've really embraced the idea of it being all about well-being. They're reallocating right now. They're looking at their budgets and they're reallocating to where they can get the most value. Um, you know, you need ingredients like amazing leadership involved as well from both um, elected officials and administration. So their mayor is probably the best example of leadership that I've seen um, at the council level, uh, really embracing his role of, you know, getting the pulse of the community and, and looking at it, you know, more robustly than we have in the past, including those those well-being um, attributes. I heard that you've been doing some consulting. We just talked to Sarah Elder Chabadera, who, who mentioned Barry Morishita yeah. in the Alberta party. Uh, my understanding sure. is you've been talking to Barry. And I know that Barry, like, I don't know if there's anybody working harder than him right now in Alberta. The guy's tried visiting like 87 ridings, trying to line up candidates. He wants to, to hey, he wants to get the Alberta party back in the legislature. And 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 it's a tough road to hoe right now because I think a lot of people, and, and I'd say this I do say this to Barry's face. A lot of people right now are looking at the Alberta political landscape and saying it's a two-party system. You know, it's going to be Danielle v. Rachel next year. That's going to be the election. And I know that, that Barry wants to do things differently, but he's got to get people's attention. He's got to get on people's radar. He's got to convince people to give the Alberta party their vote. Can talk about budget or can a, an a, can approach to, uh, to budgeting be sexy enough, Kelly, to grab people's attention and sway their vote, do you think, if it's argued properly? Well, my answer would be yes, yeah. but it's all in how you package it. Yeah, Barry's reached out to me. Um, you know, my local NDP candidate as well, Kyle Kozowski, has reached out to me. He, We are meeting later this afternoon to talk about priority-based budgeting. So um, it is on the radar a little bit. Um, I want to be that guy that's screaming it from the rooftops that, um, you know, let's let's get more robust, like I said, about our conversations. It's too easy. You give everybody a pass when we talk about the the end result being taxes and, and lower taxes. Um, let's let's get real uh, about the talk around budgeting. There's just a lot more to it. Do you um, think that the than, average than just the taxes? Sorry to step on your toes there, Kelly. Do you think the average That's citizen? Okay. You think the average citizen or the general population actually has more power in this regard than they realize? They do, and I don't think it would take much to to get engaged in the right way. Um, you know, there's obviously things as administrations um, and councils that we can do better, uh, but I think it's a two way street um, engagement. You, you you need to do your part as a citizen to to learn a little bit more about what's there. And um, this analogy that I've heard before, we're not as as local government, we're not a, a vending machine. You know, you don't just plug in your taxes and and push a button and don't know what's behind the scenes. It's real people that are living in your community and are passionate about doing the right things. So, um, you know, there there is a relationship there that is key. And like every relationship, it's two ways. So, um, yeah, I think I think getting more informed um, and and don't be shy about asking for more. Don't be shy about asking a lot of questions and being really curious about what's going on. Yeah, and people oftentimes will look at a budget and say, well, how did this facility get you know fifty thousand dollars or how did this group get one hundred and fifty thousand dollars or how did two million dollars wind up here it's because people have advocated for it people have pounded the payment and did the work and communicated that priority to governments and decision makers right I and mean, this is kind of the whole point it's how it happens it's how it works yeah right and and back to my conversation around leadership it isn't always about saying yes um i think uh, genuinely listening to the public and being real about, you know, we can't be all things to all people. I get it. it. It's, you know, everybody's dollar needs to go as long as, as far as it possibly can these days, including tax dollars. So, you know, with those priorities and really embracing them, um, you will have to say no to some things, but it, it should be based on that value around driving community good and community need. Um, and community aspirations love it T today's show has, has has wound up being conversations with two politically engaged people uh that work day in and day out to get others around them more informed and engaged and and that's exactly what we endeavor to do i'm grateful for your time and perspective here kelly if people want to learn more about this and kind of dig into this a little bit uh it's logical.ca your website for its logical strategic planning anything else you want to put on people's radar a great book you've been reading or a, a resource people can check out 
Well, um, I'm always a big fan of Simon Sinek. Um, it all comes down to your big why, and I would say that for government as well. Um, and I've hopefully articulated what I think the big why is, and that's um, community well-being. So, uh, yeah, go back to that old, old uh, dusty book on your, it's, it's been around a long time, but I, I keep, I find myself going back to it often. Good stuff. Uh, Kelly Rudick, thanks for being such a great friend to the show. And it's nice to get you on here finally. Super. Thanks, uh, Ryan. Be well. Yeah, you bet. Right back at you. I love that. Sarah, Kelly, both of them today, just, uh, you know, sort of like giving us something to think about when we talk about political engagement and involvement, like some really focused points here. Mm -hmm. Uh, And again, curious to know where this is landing with you, Real Talkers. You can hit us up. Of course, our hashtag Real Talk, RJ, you know about that and talk at RyanJesperson.com. Uh, this this whole budget talk, I, I know that, you know, for, for a lot of people, it's like mm, budget, we're going to talk budget, but like it matters. It, it's something that impacts you, uh, you know, almost every single day, you know, whether it's uh, taxes or what's being funded in your community, what's not being funded. And so we want to make sure that we're up to speed and driving those conversations. That interview was presented by our friends at Eden Landscaping. Uh, this is the time of year, of course, where, you know, most people are going to be looking outside, preparing for the, the frost to be touching down. Then the snow is going to fall. Well, that's when Mike and his team, this is a family owned business at Eden Landscaping. They're going to be drawing up the plans. They're going to be drafting, of course, all of the designs that will be bringing outdoor spaces to life in spring. Sometimes that means they got to pull the real property reports. Sometimes it means they got to get the appropriate permitting from municipalities. You know that sometimes that can take longer than expected. And if your project is going to be really top shelf, really next level, you know, they may be ordering construction materials from halfway around the world. Give them time to get here. Why delay? There's no reason to. Today's a great day to check out Eden Landscaping online at landscapeedmonton.ca. You can make contact with Mike there, of course, under the Sponsors tab as well on our website. Get the ball rolling. Make your dream a reality next spring. Our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park want to remind you that the fall blizzard lineup is now available at their locations in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and in Sherwood Park at Baseline Road. This is how they roll. The pumpkin pie blizzard some people wait all year for this blizzard this is one of the legendary lineups through the fall of course their stack burger collection is well available at the dairy queens of northwest edmonton and sherwood park a big shout out to the lieber and cardinal families that proudly own and operate those locations big support for real talk as well and of course you know tomorrow friday that means another edition of trash talk coming up presented by our friends at local environmental services across alberta and saskatchewan local environmental services is elevating people's expectations when it comes to their garbage and recycling management but they're about a whole lot more than that community services landfill water hauling vacuum trucks fencing portable toilets this company is growing and growing and growing that means they're hiring too you can learn more about local environmental services at localenvironmental.ca we've got some good fired up trash talks as you might imagine i can't wait Uh, tomorrow i can uh... (laughs) I can imagine what they're about. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you know, people upset about the gum on the sidewalks yeah, and stuff like that. Johnny. It's like just your average stuff. The buses stuff. are late in the morning. Yeah, okay. exactly. <laughs> just that kind of stuff. Have you been paying attention to the Alex Jones story? I have. Yeah, your thoughts? I mean, for the host of InfoWars, the, the the conspiracy. I mean, the guy, I, I got to watch my language here when I talk about Alex Jones. I was thinking, like, the, the one reason that you might want to believe in hell is that you can believe that there's a place that Alex Jones can burn for all eternity. Uh, ordered yesterday to pay $965 million, nearly a yeah. billion dollars for false claims about the horrific Sandy Hook Elementary School massacre. Of course, this guy's been saying that it's a hoax, yeah. uh, and he's doubled and tripled down on that. And, well, he's and also said he has no money, which is crazy, because have you like, nobody been on his that. website? Yeah, nobody believes that. The amount of supplements that. and survival gear and stuff he sells, and that's outside of advertising. So, uh, so as those judgments are coming down yesterday, he's mm-hmm. he's on he's on he's live on Infowars. He's laughing. He's mocking the families. These are families that have lost little kids mm-hmm. uh, murdered in their elementary school for a perspective check. Yeah. And he's there laughing. He's laughing. He's looking into the camera. He's going, you actually think you're going to get your money? You actually think you're going to get your money? And then he's encouraging all of his followers to go, like you said, buy his supplements, to donate money. Yeah. 
uh, when he was ordered to open up his books and some of the insights people have had absolutely bonkers, the hundreds of millions of yeah. dollars that his company has made on the backs of people. He makes a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money. And it's, it's funny, like, the downfall. Because I remember when I was like 19, 20, and Alex Jones had yeah, some crazy ideas, some conspiracy. He was talking a lot about Illuminati and you yeah. know, how presidents in the United States are chosen. Sure. But fast forward 20 years... And this is this is the spiral that this kind of thinking can take, right? Yeah. It just goes so far to where, I mean, what would what would convince you that, you know, a school shooting w- was theater is just beyond me. It's not that he believes that it is; it's that he has found he's, he's a group of money people of that will believe off exactly. of a theory that he knows isn't true. He's found a way yeah. to monetize uh, the destruction of lives. Mm-hmm. And uh, and to me, it's just it's I don't even have the words for it. It's a story we're monitoring. It's a story we're keeping an eye on. It's it's like an unprecedented court judgment, a mm-hmm. billion dollars. Because the last one was nothing. What was the last one? Yeah, it was, was a couple hundred million. Which, I mean, it was big because yeah. as people have known, yeah, there have been these suits from a number of the different families. And, the, and then this one has 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 been big. This one, uh, this story, this judgment coming down yesterday after we went off the air, so to speak. It's the second big judgment against his relentless promotion of the of the idea that that massacre never happened um filed by the relatives of five children and three educators that were killed in that shooting plus an fbi agent that was among the first responders to the scene imagine that you imagine being in law enforcement you were there and then you've got a guy with a platform like his saying it never happened and i didn't mean to laugh over what you were saying oh i know i'm just thinking about again what i said how his theories have gone from like you know there's there's a a secret uh, group of people running the world to you know, gay frogs and all this crazy stuff. It's just, it's, somebody had to, you know, give them a, I don't want to say slap on the wrist because it's, it's millions. It's a pretty big one. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, you have to, it's like when people say, you know, you can say whatever you want, but you you have to face the consequences. You have to face, you have to have responsibility for what you say sometimes. And that uh, just, the things he said about those school shootings, I was just like, are you serious? Like, it, it, it's like, like, it's just like the word despicable. It, it feels insufficient. Yeah. You know, Tony right now is watching, says, I still can't understand how people will believe the BS uh, that people like Alex Jones will spew. I mean, how gullible do you have to be? Right. You know, Corey says there's always going to be a group of people that will believe in anything simply because they want to believe in something. And that's how it was when I was younger. I I thought, you know, you know, I was all like, you know, screw, screw the police and all this stuff. And so I wanted to believe that there was and I, I'm not saying there aren't evil people in the world. And I'm not saying money isn't, you know, the root of all corruption and that things are geared a certain way by powerful people. But just the things he says nowadays are they're they're too wild. They're a little too wild. And people are allowed to say whatever they want. But when it is about children dying. It kind of. Well, and you talk about freedom of speech and then you talk about, you know, consequences Mm -hmm. and uh, this would qualify as a consequence. Yeah. Right. So uh, I don't even know. I mean, you know, I was like I was thinking today as we're preparing, we're having our coffee in the morning. We're preparing, you know, how are we going to approach the show? What are we going to talk about on the show? And in the back of my mind, I'm kind of like I I, I, and I think it's important to to address this and it's important to touch. I mean, it's it's a it's a big story and it's happening. And and Alex Jones is obviously a significant person driving. (laughs) Can I say discourse? No, it's not driving (laughs) discourse, but he you cannot deny his relevance. Um, Now, does this drive him into irrelevance? Does this force him to turn off the lights? Does this shut down Infowars? Will these families ever see uh, this court awarded judgment? I don't know. But I'm also sitting there thinking this morning as we're preparing for the show, what am I going to say about this? I was like, what's you, what's my hot take on this? I, I don't hoping, have a hot take on it. I was hoping you wouldn't bring it up because it's just like uh, it's all around bad. It's like sometimes when you're just you're you're at your annual physical at the doctor and you got to talk about the lump. Yeah. Alex Jones is the lump. And like you said, like, will they even see this money when you have that much money? You can tie people up in legal proceedings. For, of course. For a decade. Like, but this is also a motivated group. Like the fact that he's not backed off, mm-hmm. the fact that he was laughing at it and mocking it and monetizing it yesterday, to me, well, that'll motivate the families even more. The longer this goes on, the more money he makes. I mean, that's the bottom line. So it's And all the while re traumatizing these people that over have experienced the most devastating, unimaginable loss. Mm-hmm.
You can let us know where you're at on that. I suspect maybe we'll get a trash talk submission or two based on Alex Jones and InfoWars. Yeah. Well, uh, like you're a dad. He's got four kids. Uh, dude, I, can't I don't even, see I can't how even, he has no emotional connection to this whatsoever. I can't even he think about. He doesn't think in his head if this was his children. Like, I just I don't get it. So it probably comes down more to the and this is more like a, a conversation like around the table over beers and a pizza. But, but it's like, would you could you do a job? I mean, there are people right now. You ask people this, like, could you do what he does? And go home for hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. Like, wh- where would you draw the line? Yeah. Where, where, how low will you go? Uh, for Alex Jones, I mean, being worth several hundred million dollars, he'll go that low and he'll take people down with him. Yeah, but this isn't like you know playing golf in a in a country that is questionable. This is like, are you talking about the live tour? Yeah, <laughs> Very this, different. This is like going home every night and looking at your kids and be like, I just I don't get it. Yeah, and Daddy, what did you kids. what'd you talk about at work today, Daddy? Yeah. You know, well, I reminded people that, yeah, I don't think you could. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you could. Yeah. Let us know where you're at, real talkers. We prompt these conversations uh, because we want you to fire right back at us and let us know how it's landing with you. Of course, you know where to find us. You can always connect with us via the link on our website. Coming up on tomorrow's show, it is our Real Talk Roundtable, and it's going to be the first ever presented by our friends at Urban Timber. They're the ones that have uh, put together this unbelievable table we're sitting around here in our new studio. Very excited about that. So that's coming up on Friday's Real Talk. In the meantime, make it a great Thursday, friends. And of course, we'll chat with you again soon. Real Talk is on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok. Yeah, we're on TikTok. Thanks to everybody that's subscribing to our channels. Thanks to everybody that hits the like button after listening to an episode. If you rate our podcast, that means the world to us. But you know what's best? The feedback that you found Real Talk because a friend or family member told you about it. Let's bring more people into these conversations. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, Executive Producer Josh Dunford, Technical Producer John Hicks, General Manager Katie Cook Chivers, Account Coordinator Lawrence Durlego, Human Resources Lena Shepard, Website Design Mike Johnston, VoiceOver by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Sapria Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandy Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a relay project. For more, check out ryanjasperson.com.